Hello everybody, welcome to the uh, seventh Search for Meaning conversation. Uh, we've been running these conversations for since May, and this is the seventh and final for this year, so welcome. Uh, look, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're on Darug and Gundungurra land and pay my respects to Aboriginal people past and present and emerging. Um, and also acknowledge the contribution that Aboriginal people have made to the culture and history of this country. As I said, we've had uh, a lot of conversations, seven conversations, and Lulu is the lucky last. And it's been a real privilege for me to, to get to know the stories of people in the Blue Mountains. They've all been Blue Mountains people, and I, I really wanted to, to, talk to talk with Lulu because I've known her for a long time now. Uh, but I wanted to know some of the dirt in Lulu's life, which was my main motivation for doing this. <laughs> but let me just introduce Lulu very briefly. Uh, and, and hopefully there'll be some, I know there are some, some of, uh, you know, Lulu's students here uh, who will know Lulu fairly well, but I hope, hope there'll be some stuff that comes out that you don't know. Lulu grew up in the south of England as one of five girls, spent her first four years in Kenya, uh, between the ages of 4 and 18, Lulu spent her time in boarding schools. No. Sorry, Jackie? Not boarding school. No. I don't know where you got that. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, in school? <laughs> that was my father. Sorry? That was my father. Oh, that was your father I was thinking of. Okay, anyway, she spent time um, in England growing up, and she travelled after school and uh, met Alan, who became her husband, and introduced her to yoga. She went back to, uh, when she was travelling in Australia, went back to the UK and uh, became an actor. So um, then returned to Australia, went to a yoga retreat that uh, freaked her out a little bit, overwhelmed her, and she became a yoga teacher from that point on, moved up to the Blue Mountains, set up her own yoga school, and uh, she's been running that school ever since. I'd like to start off, Lulu. Um, now, I, can I just get a show of hands? Who knows? I know there are some people who are serious yoga practitioners, but um, who, who doesn't know much about yoga here? Oh, there's a few people, one at least. Okay. All right, well, I'll get you, Lulu, to talk about that a little bit. And um, I wanted to get Lulu to talk about what's happening. This is a, uh, a typical yoga pose. And uh, we're, by the way, uh, we're talking about Iyengar yoga here, acknowledging that there are many different types of yoga. But this is one of Lulu's um, poor, long-suffering students. <laughs> <laughs> having a go at um, Urdhva Dhanna Rasta, which is um, a back pose, which I call the towards infinity pose. Um, but I wonder, Lulu, if you could, by way of sort of introducing us to what Iyengi yoga is all about, could you tell us about what's going on in this pose and as a teacher what you're trying to achieve with getting people to do this ridiculous pose? I mean, really. <laughs> You might recognise that person up there. <laughs> so he's, sitting, he's sitting quite close to me. <laughs> um, so Bill's gone in at the deep end by showing you this photo. This is called Urba Damarasana, and it's actually quite a difficult pose. And um, probably the background to this is that it takes a while to get here, to this point where you can push up and have the confidence to push up into that shape. Um, so, really where it starts is there's a whole process to this point, and it's in that process that you learn about your ability to be able to move into deeper poses, such as this one. And it's really about, in a sense, building blocks. So when you start yoga, you start from your foundation, you start from your feet. Well, at this point, it feels added to his hands as well. <laughs> but you start from your feet, I could say a bit about Bill's feet, but we won't go there. Because <laughs> I tell him that every class. <laughs> um, but, you know, really, it's about how you place yourself 
on the ground to start something. And in that starting something, you place your feet, you become aware of how you've placed your feet and um, your weight bearance, how the rest of your body is balanced over there and how your spine is balanced. And I'm talking about before you've added your hands, but this is further down the line. Um, but through that process, you're starting to build blocks. So you're building blocks of understanding and you're putting one thing down first and you're understanding that and then you're adding to it and adding to it. So Phil's comment about why would you do this, it, it is quite interesting, is it? Why would you? Why, why do this and why make life difficult? <laughs> and why do complicated shapes and poses? But I think because what you're doing is you're gradually building yourself into a more complex um, shape and a more involved experience. And through that you start to learn about your response to that and you start to learn about your mind's response to that, your body's response. So it comes through the body that we start to uh, open the doors to understanding our responses in our mind. Um, when you add your hands as well, then feel starting to understand the need to be grounded both through hands and feet to be able to push up as, you know, I might over to you at this point about your coming to, towards infinity. You know, <laughs> um, it's a very experiential process, it's not just an idea. I'd like to change, I'd like to change how I respond to my mind, I'd like to change my patterns. You actually do it gradually, one step at a time, one foot, one hand, and feel like I respond to that. Your videos for that? Well, in terms of why you called it towards infinity. Okay, I called it towards infinity. I, I love this pose, however difficult it is, um, because you're pushing down into the earth and pushing up towards infinity at the same time. And uh, it's opening the heart. So I think of it sort of as opening the heart to the universe, really. And, and so, you know, as difficult as this pose is, and every time I'm asked to do it, I go, oh, God, not again. <laughs> Uh, I sort of love it in a way um, uh, because of, of this groundedness, because of this opening, uh, this pushing up towards sort of the infinite, really. And I think really it's about man's or woman's um, constant struggle between mortality and immortality, between earth and heaven. And that's our, our human dilemma and how we place ourselves in that struggle. And you can think, oh, it's just about feel pushing up. But really there's a lot of layers of experience in that, isn't there? So. There's a, a lot of uh, learning to become yeah. and just breathing in a, in a difficult pose. But I love it because it's about strength, it's about, it's about flexibility, it's about groundedness, mm -hmm. it's about connection, mm -hmm. it's about, um, yeah, being calm in a moment of a potentially exactly. extreme stress. And I think that's what the process teaches you. The more complex the pose is, the more we learn about our response and how uh, are we calm in that process? Are we able to be present and listening? So it's like a little um, mini trial for what happens out in life. So we can get more and more practiced and that's the whole key. We practice every day and we practice more and more. Then we get more practiced at catching ourselves when we are in that situation, similar situation, outside the yoga mat. So we get skilled up on the yoga mat. <laughs> That's essentially. All right. And there, there you are teaching. Um, so now, now yoga, the curious thing about the yoga you teach, Lulu, is you give all these instructions about how to, how to move the skin, very intimate parts of our being as well, uh, the muscles, the bones, um, and, and lots and lots of instruction. Now, what's the, what's the purpose of that? Uh, well, I'll probably go back to the tradition I do, which is um, the tradition of BKS Anger. And uh, he was very um, detailed about and thorough, vigorous about the detail and the discipline. And because the mind then doesn't have room to be elsewhere, so it's not a casual experience, it's very, very detailed. And that brings the mind very clearly to be present and to be exactly where you are when you're doing it. Um, the detail comes, the more detail comes as you practice. I think at first it's more just like where are your arms, where are your legs, where are you in space, you know, 
no big deal. Just feel good, and you go out feeling different. Um, but as you get more experience, then I think you get those subtleties of movement that uh, start to penetrate deeper. So you're penetrating deeper into the body, and you understand the body's intelligence to access the mind's intelligence. So we start to work from body up rather than mind down, and that, that gives us that um, intelligence to listen and become. So you can see here, one of uh, speaking, one of our teachers, but she's. It's about listening to feedback from the body. So when you're doing something, you're open to what the body is telling you rather than dominating with the mind telling the body. So you're learning from the body in its process. Now, now I, I used the phrase with you uh, once before, that yoga is about um, releasing the body in order to liberate the mind. Yeah. Um, does that is well, that how you see yoga? I, I think I bought from you said that. You and did. I was thinking you about did. that afterwards and I was thinking because actually you can see very much you, you need the body's frame. This is our tool. And you you get that is a very sort of intimate tool that you're working with. Unless you keep the body's frame very much there, you don't have that um, means to listen to feedback. So I would say you're releasing the mind in terms of your releasing tensions and hopefully changing patterns in your body. But uh, the body is very much present. It's not like it, it's not part of the picture. It's actually the, the door through which, or the vehicle through which you understand everything. So that's your question? Yes. Now, here's Lulu showing off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, I mean, the question in my mind is, you know, what, what's the real benefit in being able to do these sorts of complicated poses. I mean, you know, people do, people see um, yoga practitioners doing these sorts of poses, but what's the real benefit in terms of health, in terms of well-being, in being able to do poses like this? Good question. Um, <laughs> they're difficult. And they take a lot of practice. So they demand many, many years of application and through, that, through the years of application, then um, there's this transformational element within oneself that occurs. Uh, it's yeah. inherent in the practice, it's inherent in the pose. Um, for instance, if you take uh, Vakasana, which is the pose at the top, which is um, a balancing, you become light in order to practice that. There's a lightness that comes, there's a sense of uh, weightlessness, but also, uh, in order to practice that, you need to practice it. You need to just come to the mat, come to the mat, come to the mat. And um, as boring as it can be sometimes, it starts to suddenly shift something in you. And I think it's the art of practice that we're looking at here, really, in terms of um, <coughs> long, uninterrupted practices brings the fruits. And uh, so, so what's shifting exactly? What's shifting is you use your mental state. Okay, yeah. shifting from, from what to say. what? From what to a distracted mind, maybe a scattered mind, uh, one in which uh, you are easily swayed by outside influences around whatever's happening in your life, mm -hmm. uh, to a feeling of being more centered, quieter, so that the as the mind, as the body gets more practice, the mind has to be present to get quiet. Um, as you become quieter, then you're able to maybe develop a discerning attitude so that you can then see what's useful, what's not useful as we've spoken about, and what's useful in your in your life, how you respond, what is unuseful also starts to follow on that. So so is it sort of like um, a movement movement meditation? Is that what yoga is really? Um, yeah, I guess it is essentially. Yes it is. So well, what's the difference then in terms of benefits sitting. doing yoga compared to sitting down sitting. and doing meditation okay. practice? So um, if I was to ask you all just to sit here and put you through an hour of meditation, you would certainly get some benefits. But um, basically the, the spine here, it's about the spine. And through the action of the arms and the legs, you access the spinal column. Through the spinal column's access, for instance, in headstand here, then you start to uh, the brain has that alignment with the spine so the brain is affected the mind is affected through the health and action of the spinal column so that the nervous system starts to become quietened so that when you start to then sit for meditation and that's certainly in this um, uh, tradition 
your, your spine is, is prepared and your mind is prepared, your nervous system is ready. So that you, you've done the tilling of the soil, if you like, through the practice. And the more complicated or the, the deeper the poses, then inherent in them is a deeper, more uh, penetrative experience, takes you deeper into the practice. And so, I mean, are there, sci is there scientific evidence that shows that this, these poses are actually beneficial for us? Yes. So you're opening the heart region, the diaphragm, the lungs, all of those uh, affect your emotions, but also keep them healthy. You stay, you definitely stay fitter and healthier. Um, there's a level of fitness that it gives you, well-being, mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely sure. And you don't have to be doing super complicated poses to experience that. Everyone that's done a class might know if they've walked out, they feel better than when they walked in. And it's not by coincidence. So, uh, you know, inherent in the poses is um, a well being. But there's also scientific evidence that shows it's been beneficial for people with depression and yeah. PTSD yeah. and so on. And more and more, that probably is yoga is getting more advertised in that way these days for you know, depression, anxiety, um, and lots of medical conditions. Um, at the Institute in India, where Mr. Iyengar taught for many, many years, um, he held a remedial class there, and that still exists. The remedial classes are bigger than the general classes. Some people get wheeled in, and it's an extraordinary circus. But there's people that have been coming for years and years, and when I go there, I assist. And you start to talk to, you know, from a young boy to an old man, older man with Parkinson's, and they start to tell you the extraordinary impact that it's had on their lives. But really, through the incredible knowledge that Iyengar worked with so much detail with himself, when you talked about why is there so much detail, uh, when he began practicing, he worked with so much detail with himself, and he was so thorough with his own practice that he sort of knew his, his anatomy and himself inside out. So when it came to be able to work with others, and particularly others that had issues, he could see the imbalances and where the problems were coming from, so that he could target particular sequences for particular conditions. Mm. Yeah. And, and can it be harmful, or can you injure yourself doing oh, yoga? For sure, yeah. I think badly. <laughs> Is that from yoga? Uh, oh, sure. It's like, um, you know, if we can't be these perfect individuals every every moment of the day. And if there's, uh, you know, you're not aware of, or you're not um, in a pose with total awareness, and uh, you might hurt yourself. But I'm not saying, gosh, it's completely harmful. It's like anything you do, any sport, mm -hmm. anything where you're coming to the mat and doing gymnastics or sport or anything. There's going to be a bit of wear and tear, so sure. And I suppose the point of the detail is that it, it, it reduces the risk of, of you hurting yourself. Certainly, because it, it, and also it works on so many levels, not just the physical level, but the physiological, the psychological, the emotional. Mm -hmm. So there's many layers that it starts to work on. Um, so the well-being goes not just on the physical level, that's that's great fruit, but it really goes uh, onto a deeper level than that. Okay, let, let's 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 go back a little bit, Lulu, and sort of find out how we got to this. How do we got to this point? Um, now, you grew up in the south of England as uh, one of five girls. Okay, so was there anything in your upbringing which pointed the, you towards yoga at all? Um, not really. My parents were sort of traditional um, people. Well, what do you mean by traditional people? Well, they were, you know, if you did yoga, it was probably in their generation something a little bit of a dark. Yes, I think that's right. Um, you know, probably you'd be seen to be indulgent. They were workers and, you know, gardening was probably as far as they got. Um, I think you know, we used to be taken to church every Sunday and, and I can resonate with that. Yeah, what was boring about um, church for you? It was a very dry presentation. You'd be sitting in the pews and, uh, yes. and someone would be a much older person than yourself and would be telling you things that this shouldn't. That shouldn't. I, I, I can relate to that. I used, to, I used to run out of Sunday school class and go and go and steal lifesavers from the milk bar next door. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So I, yeah. you know, they weren't benefiting me very yeah. much either. That's so I, I think probably um, it wasn't until I came back to Australia um, when I was traveling when I was 18, 
yeah. I've met Alan, who was uh, my, then to be my future husband. That I, I sort of, I think in that year after school, when you're travelling and you start searching within yourself and you start asking bigger questions, there's a bigger world out there. So, so, so travel is sort of in the family genes, isn't it? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I think probably uh, starting my early years in Kenya, and or, well, it was only four of us at that stage, um, just gave us a bit of a taste of a, a different soil uh -huh. and then uh, a different sky and a different texture and then coming back to the UK and cold English winters <laughs> and and I don't know why the travel bug was in it but all, all my sisters have travelled so um, I was one of the youngest so seeing them come back and bring stories back sort of sparked my interest. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know why I went to the other side of the world I think because it was warmer. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay so um, you came to Australia mm. You met Alan, uh, but you went back to the UK and you became an actor. I did, yeah. Um, I did. So that's a long way from yoga, isn't it? Or is it? Well, I hadn't started yoga really at that point. No, I know, but I mean, it's not a. Yeah, it is a long way from yoga. I think, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I spoke to you about this before. Um, you know, it was a creative process and uh, it was yep. exciting and yep. um, it was challenging and you felt right in the middle of that practice or that process. Um, and then and then you came to the employment side of things and it was pretty thin on the ground. And um, you couldn't practice your art. You trained all these years for your art and then you actually mm -hmm. couldn't practice it. So you, you know, most of the time I was waitressing. <laughs> and uh, then um, when I came back out here, I had various acting jobs. But then I started doing some yoga and I realized that it was incredibly creative, incredibly fulfilling, and it was something that I could always do. I didn't have to rely on the employee to do it, or it was it was there for me, and it was an expression. Okay, but now you say it's creative. In what sense is yoga creative? It's it's an art form, really. Um, it's a, a form of expression. Hmm. Um, the shapes really are, are shapes of expression in themselves, and inherent in when you're actually taking your body into those shapes, there's there's different experiences that that you do experience when you're in them. Um, so like a dancer, I suppose. I, I suppose it is like dancing. I mean, mm -hmm. There's a lot of crossovers between yoga and dance traditionally. Mm -hmm. So it, yes, and, and in, in my acting when I was training, there was also a big dance component in there. So, uh, but a very different um, outcome. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, what's the different outcome? Very different outcome to practicing this to doing to dancing. Mm -hmm. um, I think one. This has a, a life long. Um, impact. I was dancing like a great at the time, and obviously if you dance a lot, you feel good. Yeah. The, the length of the impact and the depth of the impact is, is different. The transformational element in this is a transformational element. Okay. Yeah. Now it's, it's it's in Australia where Alan introduces you to yoga, and you go on a, a yoga retreat. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about that retreat as being completely overwhelming. Completely overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, others have been to retreats. It was a mangrove mountain um, and a lot of people were in robes and shaved heads and I was like, wow, what is this? So, so how old are you at this stage? Uh, probably 22. 22. 21, 22. Um, and I was talking and it just felt, I felt completely trapped and uh, well, all I think of was escaping. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've done very little and I think that's probably the key, that I've done very little yoga, I, I just got put right into the deep end and uh, it was a very intense experience of which I had no tools to navigate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, it, it's after that that, um, did, did you decide after that experience that you wanted to continue to or pursue yoga more deeply or? Um, I think, well I, I was in partnership with Alan and he was already getting quite involved and so I went from that experience, that was my very first experience, to doing a couple of classes and then another retreat, which was my anger retreat. Yeah. And they sort of said, oh you'll be fine, you're, at, you're with Alan, you, you know what to do. And Because uh, Alan was an experienced practitioner, uh, not was really, he? Done a little bit. He done a little bit. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so once again I was kind of dragged in there a little bit. And, um, but after that experience, and I think that was coming across the teachers that started to resonate with me, and the teaching that started to resonate, uh, that was Nyinga teach, uh, Peter Thompson and uh, Karen Hoggins, they were my first teachers. 
And, um, so what is it that was starting to resonate for you? I think probably the way it was, it, the, their expression, their language, the way they communicated the, mm -hmm. the practice started to make sense mm -hmm. and uh, draw me in. Um, it didn't feel quite so alien, it didn't feel quite so culturally so far away from what I understood. Um, was there any particular teaching or, or, or message that particularly resonated with well, you? Well, I think probably it's in, it was in the uh, art of their practice. And really, you can't teach well unless you practice well. Mm. And uh, that they were very committed practitioners at the time. Mm. And, you know, Peter as well. And, um, and also that connection between the practice and the mind was taught very well. So it's, it's not necessary that we begin teaching with the mind. We don't, we begin teaching with the body. But it's the skill of the teacher that they, through their teaching, with the, how they teach um, the practice, the poses, that they can start to give students the experience of feeling different when they walk out. And that feeling different is a good feeling. Something that something has shifted. Yeah. And you started practicing six hours a day. We were pretty keen. <laughs> <laughs> we were pretty keen. How does anybody <laughs> practice yoga six hours oh, a day? Really? But, you know, that was the eighties, Phil. And uh, <laughs> we were young and lived in a warehouse, and we converted the warehouse into a yoga studio. Okay. And, uh, uh, we did three hours in the morning various different jobs and then came back and did three hours in the afternoon and had gradually a, a group of us that we practiced together so there was a good momentum and it was the beginnings of Ayurveda yoga in Australia so uh -huh. it was exciting and uh, uh, there was an energy behind it. So you move up the Blue Mountains with, with Alan, you decide to set up your yoga studio and you're practicing running the studio for a while and then your marriage falls apart. Yeah, bang. <laughs> well, you've missed 12 years in there, actually. But, 12 years? Um, okay. Yeah, so we were in Utah for 12 years and uh, ran the yoga studio for 12 years and then yep. gradually came up here. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, yes. So uh, we had the business together and uh, marriage together, the whole caboodle. Yeah. And um, then it hit the wall after 22 years. So, yeah. That was, that was obviously a really traumatic experience for you. How did you work through that? Um, well, I, didn't, I think at first you don't have much choice. You're just thrown into it. You're right in the experience without um, seeing it coming. Or it was a mind, mind and side of things. Um, how did I work through it? One step at a time. And I think I, I came back to the mat every day. I wasn't really sure what I was doing on the mat, but that was a surety. The only thing that didn't change throughout this entire thing was the fact that I had a practice uh -huh. and that I could come back to my mat. And that was a, so that was a, a not even a known, because it was really sort of become an unknown, but I knew that I could step back through the yoga room door and, um, and I was totally blessed in that the students still turned up. And I don't even know what I talked about stage but um, uh, that those two things slowly helped me that I had two certainties in amongst an enormous amount of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, there's a particular piece of oh, literature yes, that uh, you asked me what helped me. Yes. It's five years. Yeah. So after the sort of uh, the beginnings which was you know quagma, gradually you start to lift your head and look around and, and uh, and a couple of uh, books came were really helpful. One was on the side of my, beside my bed. It had been beside my bed for years, and it was a book called "When Things Call and Fall Apart" by uh, a Buddhist monk, um, nun called Pema Chodron. And the other book was this one, which is "Letters to a Young Poet" by Maria Reina Rilke. And gradually, I just started opening literature and it started to speak back to me. And I suppose I was in a, a position where I was open to change. And this was probably something that spoke very clearly at the time, that um, uncertainty was not necessarily a bad thing. And that knowing certainty, I'd had a lot of certainty in my life, and that that wasn't necessarily going to help me grow. In fact, it was uncertainty that was going to help me grow. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um, 
I found that this, I love that. Um, so do you, do you want to re reinforce the, the part which is, was really important for you? Yeah, to be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and to try to love the questions themselves, like the locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which, not, which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And I think that was, that was what resonated. That, um, although I knew that there was going to be enormous change, I didn't necessarily understand how that was going to shape and um, what the future was going to look like. But to actually just be open to the fact that there was um, a lot unsolved and a lot that would never really be answered, and I'll never really get an answer for it, was okay. And to actually just relax with that. And then doors started unlocking for me. And the, un the, the questions themselves started to make sense. Um, there wasn't really an answer to them, to be honest, but in accepting the fact that there was an uncertainty and that was okay was the key. <laughs> and, 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 and accepting all the uncertainty around, you know, the breakup of the marriage exactly. and so on. And yeah, all that, all that had been um, there, you know, that you could navigate was no longer navigation. <coughs> so uh, it was gradually putting one thing back that was one thing at a time and it was going to come back differently and um, that was fine. And I think, you know, at first people that have obviously experienced things like this, there's a, there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of uh, anger. And I think then um, at a certain point, I recognized that uh, anger wasn't use useful and that it was starting to change uh -huh. me into something I didn't want to be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I think if you hang on to anger past its use-by date, it starts to mute into something else. So it's useful up to a point. And then it's useful up to a point. And <laughs> then you start opening books and seeing that there's a whole infinite world there and and also that anger contracts your world uh -huh. and this expands you know the, the unknown and the yeah. questions that you don't have the answers for yet expand your world yeah. yeah and the whole practice of yoga is about expanding the body it's the it? whole practice of yoga so it took me into a very different relationship with how i practiced or mm. not how i practiced but how i understood the practice okay and um yeah, reflected very differently back to, to, to me, to the mm -hmm. importance of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and keeping yourself very grounded. It's a very real grounded experience. You can't just think the ideas, you actually have to do them. And so you experience them in a very grounded way. So. And, and you've, we talked about that before, you said, you know, it's, uh, you said it's very difficult to talk about yoga because yoga is experiential, yeah. essentially. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it is. Um, as those of you that know that uh, have done it, I think you 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 experience it in your in your body and in your cells, and you, you slowly experience the change then in your mind that that brings. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a whole description for that. Um, when you go to the although when you do go to the um, you know the texts, you realise that oh okay, there's a whole description for my experience in there. Um, so I'm talking about uh, potentially. Sutras, potentially sutras that we base our practice on, and um, when you start reading the sutras after you practice for a long time, they start to make sense. It's like this uh, navigation through a you know, wild sea, but um, they start to speak back to you after a while. At first, you look at them and think, "What was that?" <laughs> yeah. Now you spent a lot of time studying yourself with um, Mr. Ayenga in in India. Yeah. What was that experience like? Amazing, totally. He's, uh, so this BK Sayinga is uh, in the 70s as a younger, well actually Sayinga, but he's, he's close to 50, late 50s, early 60s when the institute opened. So this is early to early days. So this um, is in, in Pune, in this India. This is in Pune, in south of Mumbai. And south of Mumbai. Is, this is the institute. And it's really a, a very family run place. You, know, you think of all these big yoga places going to be super duper, but it's basically him and his family. And he's, he built the institute opposite his, his family home. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> what, was this experience, what was this experience like of studying yes, in it, India? Um, so yes, by the time I went to India the first time, I'd been, you know, I thought I knew, I knew what this was all about. I've got this yoga thing under my belt. 
And, uh, and I walked in the door and the first man I bumped into literally on the stairs was Mr. Hanger. And he has a very powerful presence. But outside the young room, he's just a little old friendly grandfather. <laughs> and then inside the yoga room, he turns into this uh, lion. <laughs> Pretty scary, actually, um, because there's nothing that misses his eye. So he's, he's got an eye for the whole room. Nothing misses his eye. He's very thorough, but he's, he takes you to an experience and he keeps you completely present. So by the end of being in a class with him, you realize that you've been in the hands of a master. And that's the experience that you have. Yeah. So you forgive him for being quite so scary. Um, in the younger ones, he's scary. Outside, he's a, just a friendly, funny <laughs> uh, grandfather. And, and he came to yoga through illness, didn't he? Personal he illness? Had, he started yoga when he was 14, yeah. So yeah. he had rickets and tuberculosis, and he was sent to um, stay with his uncle, who taught yoga in. Um, Southern India, the dress. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was really sent there to get better, but ended up under very, very uh, austere teaching, uh -huh. a bit like they might do with Russian gymnasts. Um, yeah, pretty hard, hardcore with the uncles, Krishnachara. And, and I suppose, too, the whole experience of being in India adds another dimension of challenge. Absolutely, absolutely. Because if you fight it, and uh, you're, if you're in India and you're very tense and you want everything to be just so, it's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> and after a while you realise that you just have to relax with it and be open to uh, whatever happens in India and it's always okay. Something, it's always okay in the end. Um, yes, and almost uncertainty with every day when you get up and walk out of the streets of India, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Uh, if you try and catch a train and you want it to be as you would here, you want your ticket to be so, and you want the time to be so, you're rubbing up against uh, problems, <laughs> creating problems for yourself. Yeah. So, sort of reflecting on all of that, um, what's, what's yoga given you, really, Lulu, over all these years? Mm. I think it's how, would you, how would you sum it up? Um, it's given me a, a home and a place of refuge. And, um, and I think it's also given me an opportunity to learn about myself and to grow. And I'm still a baby at that, so I can't say that I've, I've you know, reached a thorough understanding. But it's uh, a place that I can return to every day, and um, it's a place where I can re it reflects back, gives me a place that I can reflect and learn. And the practice isn't going to go anywhere because it's, it's here, right here. And um, so I think it's a huge privilege. I can't imagine not having this kind of place in my life and how you get through all the turmoils of life without having that place to come to. Um, I can't imagine. I suppose you know, some people might say, well, I go to my garden or I go to the rock face or uh, I walk, um, I go to my mat. I do okay. things too. <laughs> so, 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 so what's what's each day look like for you then, in terms of your practice? You mean actually, how do I practice? Or what well, well I mean, do you get up at three o'clock or five no, o'clock? I, I hate to disappoint. <laughs> 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 I don't, and it's changed, I suppose, over the years. Early, early times, we were doing six hours a day. Yeah. Um, and, and Gita, actually, I haven't talked about Gita. She was my main teacher, who was okay. Guruji's daughter, um, and she sort of. She was more real about it in some ways because she said, you know, we're householders, we have children, we have uh, work responsibilities, we run businesses. We... So over time, at the beginning when we were young, yes, we had those hours to do six hours a day. Um, now, I, uh, two hours a day is good, and on weekends that is flexible according to family or teaching. So you do that every day, two hours? Yeah. Every, every morning or break it up? To... Uh, that depends, actually. I try to do it in the morning, but if I got teaching commitments, that might change. Does it make a difference whether you do yoga in the morning or the afternoon or the evening? I think it does, but I think we've got to be realistic and not try and put this, it has to be a certain way. And I think that's when it becomes less accessible to people, because I think, mean, oh, two hours, they'll never do that. 
So, you know, what, what is manageable for you with your commitments? Is it the morning that you get up and do 10 or 15 minutes before you go to work? Great, you do that every day, then gradually you'll think, hmm, I, I like a bit more. Um, so it's, it's, it really has to, I think, um, look at the whole picture of your whole life and see what's real and what's realistic so that you can sustain it. And practice is really about sustaining. It's about being sustainable and not really uh, just to yourself, but to everybody. So it, it, you don't want to set something up that you're going to not be able to sustain. But hopefully you'll set it works in the morning for you better, it works in the evening because you don't feel so stiff or the children aren't there or there's so many different factors. Um, and I think as long as you can just sustain it, that's the that's the essence that you come back to it, you come back to it, come back to it. And gradually you those blocks I was talking about get built up, those relationships get bigger in inside yourself with your practice. Um, so maybe keeping it real. Mm. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's something you talked about, uh, the idea of if you, uh, yoga makes you feel completely authentic about who you are. I think the practice itself demands a certain authenticity because you can't be dishonest with mm. uh, how you are in, in, a, in a pose and also your te teacher will pull you up. You can't fake it in yoga, can you? Can't you can't really? fake it, no. <laughs> and that was used to be, that's the scary thing. You, you felt that uh, Mr. Angan could see right through you. Yeah. There's no faking anything. So that was quite scary, that was very confronting. But after a while that um, that becomes uh, very supportive. Mm -hmm. Because it has to be real. Really, really and uh, we, we started off talking about, you know, the, the, the title was um, Towards the Infinite. And I just wanted to show proof of the fact that Lulu's, <laughs> Lulu has got there. <laughs> So so Lulu did reach the infinite. She, yeah, she, did get, she has got there <laughs> through her yoga practice. Through yeah. a lot of hard walking. Yeah, and it is hard work. I don't think you uh, make inroads. Uh, Hank Shogun used to say, "You can't change yourself by stroking yourself with feathers." Uh, you know, it's it's sweat and it's hard work, and and then the effort pays off and it becomes less hard work but uh, more rewarding. I think we might finish on, on that note and uh, so I'd like you to thank Lulu. And I'd like, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm just interested if you with yoga, was it deliberate that you went to the Vayana or you could have gone to Hatha or any yeah. different sort of yoga? So I'm just wondering how, had you tried other yogas? Um, I've done a few, not much, not a, much in other styles. Um, it was a uh, coincidence, I suppose, that um, Alan was at that stage going to an Iyengar teacher and I got taken on to Iyengar. I didn't really feel the need to go anywhere else. I sort of found a home. And um, the language, the approach, everything about Ayanga Yoga spoke volumes. Um, I dabbled in a couple of other styles, but um, didn't resonate. And I, that's just for me. It's not necessarily for everybody. And there's different styles and different practices that are going to suit others. Do you have any um, photos of, say, what a foundation one works and um, because the, the poses you showed, I imagine the level three or something, are they? These poses are difficult. Yeah. <laughs> those are definitely not. That, in fact, some of those poses were for my senior level certificate, so that's, you can give an idea of, uh, oh. they are difficult. Um, so yes, there's basic poses which we come back to as senior practitioners every day. And the beauty in them is that your experience within that changes. So you might be doing the same pose. I've been doing the same poses for 30 years, but my experience within them shifts. And um, so, yeah, there are, there's, I think some of the basic poses are some of the, the gems. Absolutely. And, um, and they're very accessible. Yeah, totally. You don't have any photos of them? Uh, do you bring any photos of them? 
Uh, none of the basic poses. <laughs> 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 we, we do it in the studio. <laughs> yes, Cheryl. Uh, that was just recently, actually in April. We we went for uh, three weeks. Yeah, and so it seen that with your daily practice, how did you? Was there a certain mindset that you sort of transitioned when you were doing the trip? Did it help? I think the challenges the definitely the challenges of being up at altitude and the challenges of uh, the effort and the difficulties. Um, the practice gave me that. Um, support and just to be in the body breathing and, and stay calm <laughs> um, so yeah i mean in that situation it's very difficult to do practice in fact i trekked in nepal a couple of years before and uh, at one stage at nearly 4,000 meters they wanted me to teach some yoga class on the top of their <laughs> roof in nepal and it was challenging at that height in, in that, and also that you're exhausted and so probably just Having the, um, the practice behind me when I went is probably more important than actually practicing when I was there. Yeah. Yes. When you talk about not being able to fake it, what does that actually mean? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I should probably ask some of my students here what they feel <laughs> about that. Um, I think particularly in terms of when you're under the eye of a very good teacher, and that their understanding has come through hard work and practice. It's uh, that's the only way you can really um, teach. So in terms of teaching, I can't fake it from a book because that that will run out pretty quickly. Um, it's a little bit, I suppose, talking about being an actor. It's a bit like uh, being on stage, not really knowing your lines. It's a really scary place to be. But in terms of um, not being able to fake it in yourself. I think uh, when you come back to your mat every day, if you are faking it, you'll get bored. And if you're not faking it, it's a constant creative process that unveils itself. Yeah. Lulu, I can, I can speak from personal experience. Yes, <laughs> Lulu comes around, when, when I do poses, if, if the leg's not completely straight, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, you know, or, or um, uh, yeah, I, I have a tendency a lot of poses to not get that leg, you know, quite as straight as it should be. Love, Lulu will come around and say, yeah, lift that knee caps, get it straight through, come on, straighten that leg. I think that's oh, not yes, faking it. So she won't let me fake it. And there's a reason behind <laughs> it. So if the mind's not really there, mm -hmm. you know, the body's, you can see it, where the mind is slipping away from the body. It's yeah. the body, and you can see where you're present. So if there's a you're doing a practice but your mind is thinking about shopping, then there's a duality there. Yeah. And in that duality, in the gap between the mind being somewhere and the body being somewhere else, the leg goes bending. The leg goes bending. Yeah. And if you keep practicing like that, then the mind is never really going to change. There's never going to be that relationship. So the body is, is, doesn't lie, but the mind can lie quite nicely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> My body lies all the time. <laughs> Anna. And Lily, what's your favourite part about teaching? And like when you're really tired, yeah. what brings you back to the teach About teaching, did you say? Uh, the students. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, and what students, student, students keep you real and keep you on your mat. And, uh, and also, when you are in a, in a room and, and it's, uh, I think last weekend I did a workshop down the south coast and it's in a, in a wall with the doors open to the paddocks and the cows are outside in the field and, and we're all there practicing this intense practice in this paddock and they were totally there, receptive, and then it becomes very creative and then there's a, almost a conversation that happens between you and the student body um, in the way you can take them and you're taking them places that uh, they haven't been before and that can change them, get and open a lot of doors. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a real privilege as a teacher, isn't it, uh, to, to, to make a difference in somebody's life yeah. in that way. And also that they, they make a difference to my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it works both ways. And I learn a lot from my students, a lot, more than I do from myself. So. Mm. 
Any other questions? One good question uh, about how did you develop as a teacher? Did yoga develop further because you became a teacher from coming from a student and then becoming a teacher? How yeah. did that Okay, I was, I was in the early days when Iyengar Yoga was really just being set up. So I'd only been doing classes for a couple of years when my teacher said, how about teaching all the early morning classes every day? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Whereas now, you know, you might have eight years of training. Um, so for me, it was a little bit in the deep end and then swimming backwards and learning the other way. Um, I think nowadays, uh, the teaching, to become a teacher, especially in our, in our tradition, there's, there's a long training, and really it's about the practice. We see that they're really solid in their practice first, and it's practice-based understanding. So uh, we see a lot of, nowadays, short teacher training courses, far too short, six weeks online, that kind of thing. So there's not a there's not a natural evolution in their practice before they start teaching. So they're teaching out of information and they're teaching from ideas. And uh, that has a finite course. And also it's uh, yeah it's not it's not traditional to teach from the head down, we're teaching from the feet up. I'd like to give Lulu a round of applause. Now, we do have a raffle, and uh, the lucky winner, I'll get Lulu to draw it, gets four free yoga classes with Lulu. And by the way, well, the, with me, with or, or with, with, with one of the teachers at the yoga studio, and these brochures at the back. You're interested, and and just look. If it's not for you, you might know of someone, you might have a friend who might benefit from four free, free classes to see if yoga might be for them. And I think it's important to, to mention to Lulu that uh, you can start yoga at any age, can't you? Yeah, definitely. And I hope we haven't scared you. Is that still working? How we haven't scared you by showing the harder poses? <laughs> because definitely you can start at any age. And it's not religious, it's for anybody, any age, any time. So, yep, it's one step at a time, one foot down on the mat, then the other foot, and that's how you start. So, yes. And, and one of the great poses is just lying down flat. <laughs> <laughs> that is a favourite, actually. It is a favourite pose. <laughs> it's the reward. <laughs> so, I'll ask Lulu to very kindly... Whoops! There it is. There it, it is. That, that must have yeah. meant to be. I think so. Um, so it's purple, A23. A23. <laughs> <laughs> go, go again, go again. Because you'll probably be doing a class with Anna. <laughs> that was meant to be too. Um, A16. Great. <laughs> so, um, I guess after it's down the back, I'll just... Yeah, so I have a chat with Lula afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Great, Thanks. Cassie. Okay, great. Um, so look, I'd, I'd like to just finish off by um, mentioning to everybody that by coming here to the conversations that we've been running over the past six months, you are supporting uh, Girls Education in Peru, which is a project that Cultural Connections supports and um, I was sort of partly involved in the early stages in setting this project up. So, so you are contributing to a very worthy cause, these young girls. So I'll say that first of all. Um, the second thing I wanted to, to say was that it's been a real privilege to have run these uh, conversations over the past seven months. Where we started off in May with the conversation with um, Elliot, local musician and uh, recovered alcoholic, and he talked about music and recovering from alcoholism. Alcoholism. We talked with Jay Headley, a, an executive coach, and his, his thoughts about living a meaningful life. And we've spoken with uh, Jude and Mary Waterford, who have been involved in setting up um, uh, projects in East Timor. Uh, we spoke with Kunjok, a Tibetan, um, a former Tibetan nomad and a Buddhist monk, and, and about his experiences. Uh, and John Merson, uh, an environmentalist passionate about climate change. And so it's been an absolutely, really stimulating, interesting few months. 
And the good news is these are all going up on YouTube, so you'll be able to see all these in the new year. And uh, the other good news is that um, I'm going to be uh, running conversations again next year uh, around the theme of stories of courage, resilience and survival. So if you know of someone who fits that description, please let me know. Um, I'm just in the process of starting to research and find out, you know, work out who, who, will talk, who I'll talk with. But uh, yeah, so the stories are going to continue. And I guess I'm passionate about this because I believe in the power of story to change, change people. And the power of changing the world one conversation at a time, which is what's inspired this whole series. And um, so I'll finish there. And once again, thank Lulu for a really interesting conversation. And thank you. Thank you for coming. And also I want to thank Ludwig down the back. It would be very remiss of me not to thank my good mate Ludwig for doing the filming. And Cheryl, of course, for helping out on the desk. Ah, I've got a gift for Lulu. Oh, thank you. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming. And uh, look, I will be um, keeping you in the loop with what's happening next year. When we start to run these um, conversations again, I'll, I'll let you know. Have a nice Christmas and uh, keep safe. Thank you. Thank you.